definitely. Um, all right, I'm going to move us along. So you finish high school, the, <laughs> the high school years, we get through it. Uh, drop out of AIT and a day after dropping out of the journalism course for missing classes, Wells was invited to co-host the first episode of Habit. Is, is, that, that, is that the timeline that, is that as you remember factual it? factual as well? Because sometimes these, these exact time frames get stretched. No, that was it. That was, I, I think I, I didn't, I think if I remember rightly, and you know sometimes you, you create these stories in your mind and then, mm. but I, I'm pretty sure what happened was uh, I was in my last year, I was in the last term of the last year, yes I was, it was, in, it, it, it was divided into two semesters in those days for some reason, I was in the second half and I hadn't gone to a whole lot of lectures in the morning and it meant you didn't get terms requirements to sit a, an exam and so I wasn't allowed to sit the exam and I remember the head of communications at the time called me and said you can't sit the exam because you haven't gone to these lectures you haven't got your terms requirement and I was reading the news at BFM at that stage and I was reading the breakfast news with Mikey Havoc and it was on at the same time as a lecture or something like that and I thought to myself this seems a bit unusual because I'm actually doing you know some kind of the same sort of thing that we're meant to be studying here I'm actually doing it in the world and but and I did say that to the to the head of uh, communications at the time, but she was like, "No, that doesn't really work like that. That's not part of the requirement." So she said, "Sorry." I remember being quite upset about that. I I, I was pretty gutted because I would have liked to have at least been able to sit the exam, and that meant that I would have had to come back for another year at the end of that. Um, and not that I was doing well in that course anyway. To be fair, I think C's get degrees, and I think mm. I was just getting that. You know, I really just I was mainly focused on going out. So you, you're re reading the news for Mikey. Um, We've had him on the show. He's one of the most charismatic people. Oh, you're a very charismatic person, but Mikey Havoc, in his prime, in his pomp, just seemed to have this electric energy. Did you gravitate to that straight away? Did you know? Did he have an aura around him from the first time you met? Oh my God! Did he ever? Like ne on another level. And at the time, definitely the most, the funniest, most charismatic, sharpest, well, you know considered person that I'd ever met in my life and so worldly and had such interesting opinions on things and I mean I must have been maybe 19 or something when I met him and he was very hospitable to me and and really welcomed me in a and you know I it was such a great time in my life when I first met him and um and I, I can't explain to you how that guy if he was in a room, there was nobody else, uh, you know, there was nobody else you'd, you would want to, to give a room energy. He had an energy that was unmatched. And uh, look, a lot of people would say that, you know, that may have come from different reasons, but, <laughs> but it wasn't. It, it came from inside of him. You know, he, he, was, he was amazing. He was a, the best company you could ever imagine. What would it, you know, if you, you go and hang out with other people after you've hung out with him and it's kind of like, I don't know. It's like going from drinking absinthe to you know a, a, a water or something. Like he's just he's he has an amazing energy about him. The the story I'd heard about how Havoc started was that he met uh, Neil Roberts at a nightclub and yeah. kind of charmed him and won him over, and then he decided <laughs> to give him a show. Have it a show. Is that <laughs> he did. That's exactly what happened. And I remember him coming into to radio on the Monday morning or maybe the Tuesday, and and where I I was doing the breakfast, and he goes, "Guy, this is craziest thing happened to me in the weekend." Because I think it was at, um, it was at a place called the Staircase, um, which was like a bar on a uh, nightclub on K Road. It was like mainly a gay club that that did night that did dance parties and stuff, and uh, and yeah, I remember him coming in and saying like, I met the head of TVNZ on Saturday night, and here we are, you know, dancing away, and uh, and he said to me, you know, I've I've just bought MTV and um, I bought the rights for MTV Europe and New Zealand, and he goes, I need local content. Would you be interested in doing a show? And Mikey's like, yeah. He goes, yeah. I said, what did you say? And he goes, of course. I said, yes, of course. And he goes, and, and I've got to get a prop to him by the end of the week. And uh, and so that was how that was that was born. And I think then Mikey went away and, and came up with a whole lot of crazy ideas that he'd always wanted to do. And the other thing with Mikey, he was he, was, he knew how to use language amazingly and, and he could paint superb visual pictures on radio. But what people didn't see was he also was very visual you know, with things that he'd do. And he 
was giving sketches to friends all the time. Like the things that he would do, he was always acting and and being funny. And he had loved using props and yeah, he, he was an incredibly creative guy. And uh, and so I thought and TV's like T V was made for him. You know, and uh, and yeah, so then he put that prop in, and then Neil Roberts, I think, said yes. How quickly into it did you realise that it was something pretty special? Because it blew, it was so new on TV screens in the late 90s. Well, there was, there was, we, you have to look around at what else was on at the time, and I think our show was a reaction to what else was on, and Mike has probably told you about this, but, but it was, uh, it was a lot, things were very safe on New Zealand television in the, in the late 90s, and, we would, I, I think, probably previous to the to the kinds of things that we were doing in terms of the tone, probably the only other thing that was around before us was probably Marcus Lush's segments on Newsnight, which had the same kind of sensibility as things that we were doing. Marcus Lush also coming from BFM, Paul Cassily being the director of Marcus Lush's segments on Newsnight. But I remember watching Newsnight as a kid. It was a TV2 news show. With Ali Moore mm. used to host it, and before that, Simon Dello and Ali Moore and Laurelie Mason at certain times as well. But anyway, Marcus would sit there, and then at the end, you would just wait for these Marcus's story at the end because he'd go to inorganic rubbish collections and just walk around and talk. And he was so funny and and the, and and absurd. And that was kind of you didn't see a lot of that on TV. It was all pretty straight down the line and heavily manufactured. Um, so I think when we first started Havoc, there was not a lot of weird stuff going on. And and Mikey was a surrealist, you know, in the greater sense of it. And so it was just really about putting Mike's surreal brain and putting pictures to it, really. Mm. And I think Neil was smart to, to be able to work that out. And I remember having a couple of conversations with Neil uh, before he died, because he died very young, Neil, probably in his 50s, early 50s, I think, of cancer. And... Um, and him talking about Mikey and and uh, and Neil had a huge admiration for him and his creativity. And um, and yeah, so Neil could spot it straight away. And good on Neil. But so could Mikey. We we had he talked about you on the show because originally you were on and you were kind of going to be a bit of a silent guy who might chip in every now and then. And we, me and Shay watched back that first episode the other night with the blonde <laughs> oh, sort no. of blow out yeah. here, and oh, no. you know it was it was very havoc, but Ooh. it was a bit awkward, and oh, uh, and you were doing the soda machines, oh, and then as the seasons grew on, your role became more and more, and you really fell into this character. So he's seen something in a what were you nineteen twenty? Yeah, I think I was nineteen or twenty. Yeah, but I I think I did start as a research. I was going to be a researcher on that show. I mean, I didn't. I wouldn't even know how to. Uh, there's no Google in those days. So yeah. what was I meant to do? Go to the library. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think I yeah. did go to the library a couple Leo of times, bus. maybe in the first couple of weeks. <laughs> I can't remember. Well, maybe the first couple of days anyway. But then it did. It, it kind of evolved. But I, I think we we knew that we kind of had a chemistry anyway from radio, so there was something there. And then uh, and then it just it, it essentially evolved. And it, and it was allowed to evolve because there was no pressure. I mean, you could do whatever you want. You could you know, take a shit in the corner of the room and that would be something. Mm. I remember one day we decided that we were going to trash our set. Mikey probably talked about that. And we actually took to the set with sledgehammers. Like, this is a set that's made, you know, using TVNZ budget. And we were listening to a, uh, I think it was uh, Rage Against the Machine video because we used to play like two videos mm. a, a show. And um, we just started smashing up the set because it just kind of felt right. And we walked out that night thinking, yep, nothing unusual about that. And I mean, the people who made the set must have been like, you assholes, what did you do that for? <laughs> there was nothing about that. It was just kind of, uh, just that kind of anarchy. And then also Paul Cassily met uh, Mikey at that stage. And that was a great creative relationship in terms of that show. And uh, I'm sure Mike probably talked about that. But Paul had, as I said, worked with Marcus. Paul was also station manager at BFM for a long time. The alternative culture in those days was quite strong and there was a real difference between alternative and mainstream and we were very much in the alternative mm. camp and we saw ourselves very much as outsiders and we liked being outsiders and Paul was an outsider and Mikey was an outsider but even though they had quite different brains, uh, together Paul could make the things, Mikey's ideas, he could make them into television ideas. Um, and those two had a very strong relationship. I think you solidified your alt status when someone nailed their penis to a crucifix. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was 
don't watch and it. And then caught it on fire. And then, and I wasn't, sure, on wasn't fire. sure about that detail, yeah. Yeah, no, they lit it on fire. Yeah. It's a, yeah. It's a lot. Well, in those days as well, we were looking for the worst thing possible. So the whole thing was like, what is the worst thing that we could do on it's TV? It's up there. And that was right up there. But someone sent that in to us because they obviously got kind of the sensibility of the show. But I, I just remember thinking my, my brain process was very much what has never been done on TV before. We must do it. That was kind of where we were at. It's it's funny thinking back. Like, a, you know how disjointed your memory can be and unreliable. A lot of those Havoc episodes live on and i went searching for one of them the live eye with the pro- where you where you're wearing the the thing and you're going in with a prostitute and it's like the state-of-the-art technology tvnz have got you've somehow got a hold of it and this whole scene has kind of played out there's no sex involved but i went looking for it but i couldn't find it but it was a really sort of it was a, a clip that i kept referencing for maybe 10 15 years afterwards because there was that conversation like so, how about them warriors? <laughs> <laughs> Is, does that not exist? I couldn't find it anywhere. Oh, thank God for that. But i that's a good story because we, at the time, uh, there was prostitution law reform which was going on. And at the time, I think prostitution had been decriminalised in New Zealand. And so that was a topic du jour. <laughs> Let's get our teeth into the topic du jour, which is this issue. Because nobody else would have been touching it. It would have been one of those things. And um, and I remember Mike and I sitting down and saying, okay, what do we do? And I remember saying, well, one of us has to have sex with a prostitute. That's, that's just, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, okay. And then, yeah, you're right. and then we're like, how are we going to do that? And then at the time, we, we were involved, because we worked at TVNZ as part of TVNZ, we had access to the news library, and Paul Cassidy used to just take images out of the news library, and um, and so that was, and, and then create news stories out of it, and um, and I'd voice them, and we had access to all of the things at TVNZ, like everything, and and quite a large budget, stupidly, and so we then asked Paul Cutler, who was the head of news and current affairs, do you mind if we borrow the live eye? We, we're doing, we're filming a segment. <laughs> he was like. Okay. Like they didn't even ask what for. <laughs> and so we hiked it up that side of a brothel. And then we went into the brothel and then we, we and then I went in with a cricket helmet with a <laughs> handy cam stuck to this taped gaffer tape. The That's side right. Of it. That's and Mike right. was inside yeah. the live eye guiding me. We did a paper rock scissors before that who was going to oh, have sex so with a prostitute. So and good. I I I don't know whether I won or well, lost, yeah. I can't remember, but it was me. And then Mike was like, it's going to be okay, mate. And then it was me on the phone, the segment before was me on the phone to my partner at the time saying, oh, yeah, I've got to have sex with a prostitute, <laughs> like explaining to her. And then, anyway, I, I end up going in there and I'm, I, I didn't actually have sex with her. I was kind of pretending. And, and we, 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 she was a prostitute. That was, that was a sex worker. That was, that was um, true. Um, but then, so there I am doing that. And then I think I put a, fo- a picture of, the News Talk ZB um, radio lineup up in front of me, yes. just in case I needed, you know, in case things went, went on for some time. And I've got a Mike in the live eye who's directing me, just giving me tips on what I should be doing, what I shouldn't be doing. And then, um, oh, and then in the end, I think I ended up zooming into Murray Deeker's face upon climax. Yes. But the funniest thing about that was we did the show and it was all fine. My mother at the time was a manager of the New Zealand netball team and she was on camp in. Auckland before they went away to the World Games and she never watched that show thank God she never watched any of our, our Havoc shows she knew that it was just best that she didn't watch it but that night the girls in the netball team Bernice Minnie was the person who said to my mum come on Ducky was her name come on Ducky let's watch Jeremy's <laughs> TV show my mum's like no no it's fine <laughs> and the girls were like no come on we'll all sit down and so the entire New Zealand netball team <laughs> oh. of all the days that they would choose to watch the Havoc show with my mum was that episode. And so they sat down Amazing. and watched that. Now, can you imagine my mum? She's watching me pretend to have sex with a sex worker with all that sort of stuff and then the Murray Deeker thing at the end. And she has never, ever mentioned to me that she ever watched it. She's <laughs> never told me the story. The only, Bernice Minnie was the one that told me the story about 10 years later. And I thought, oh, my poor mum having to watch me do that. <laughs> poor Lady Cheryl. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I'm pleased that that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, we'll go, we'll go looking for it again. <laughs> um, yeah. So as this 
this sort of snowball is building and the show is so popular and it's you and Mikey, you're such recognisable characters. Like, we talked about now there's so many different avenues for people to watch. Then it was like three channels and everyone was watching the show. When you went out touring around together, was it, was there hysteria, was there, was it r- people lining up in the streets to see you guys? Yeah, there were, because I think New Zealand was quite a different place in those days. A, there was no social media. There was no internet. There were, in some parts of the country, one channel, like for example the west coast of the South Island, they didn't have a TV2, let alone TV3. So it was a different cultural landscape in those days. And TV, people who were on TV were kind of novelties. You know, nowadays it's like, oh yeah, whatever. But... But then it was it was something different, and people never people didn't see you or hear from you very often. So I think people wanted to know more, and so they wanted to see what you were like. They wanted to see you in the flesh. And so yeah, when we'd do our our sellout tours, we'd go places, and it was early days of cell phones, and so people would text other people to say, oh, you know, have a news boy are filming something in, in the main street of you know, Westport or something. And next thing you know, there'd be like yeah, heaps of people who come down just to kind of stare. <laughs> at you to yeah. sort of see whether you, whether you're real, but it was it was quite a different time. I mean, nowadays, I think now if I go to a uh, like a, a town or a supermarket or stuff, people will look at you definitely. But it's not the same as what it was in those days. It was a completely different vibe. Mm. But social media means that people get you the whole time. They can get you. They can they can basically communicate. They can DM you if they want to, and you and you DM back. So yeah, it's a different. There's a different. There was a distance in those days. Do you look back, are you the sort of person that looks back when you look back on Havoc and Newsboy? Is that something you're proud of? Do you, do you look back and are you really happy with the work you did? No. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> and I, I, I don't look back, no. Yeah, I do occasionally, if I'm doing something like this, I'll, I'll think about it. But before that, I don't really have any thoughts about it. And, I mean, I, I look, I, I'm not, it is what it is. It was something that I did and I can't. It's like the fact that I gave, you know, a cannabis, a cap of cannabis oil to a, uh, to a, you know, recovering drug addict. It's like that is something that I did. I can't take that back now, and it is, it is what it is. It's probably not the best thing to do. And if I was, I would do it again, only because if I didn't do it again, who knows what would have happened. But, uh, but, it's not something that I'm, I'm proud of. And so I don't know. I don't look back on things and go. You know, I'm particularly proud of this or particularly proud of that. I, I can't think of anything that I'm particularly proud of. Is, is it the same with Eating Media Lunch and the Unauthorised History of New Zealand? Do, do those two pieces of work as well kind of sit in that space? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'll tell you what I am proud of, and if I'm honest, I'm proud of the, the team that... Like, I'm proud of the partnership that I created along with Mikey to, to make um, the sellout tours. And I'm proud of the part that I played in the in the Havoc show and, and the, being a part of that team. I'm proud of the of the teams that I've been involved in, but my own kind of performance inside of that, I don't want to watch that stuff again. I'm not really interested. There's a memory of it in my head, and and it it, it, it but it, it happened, and I have weird memories of of stuff from the past, but I don't want to go back over and. <laughs> Relive the gold, you know. Like I, I don't, I don't think it was gold myself. But, it, but I, I was definitely proud to be a part of the team. And, and, and when people come up to me and say that they enjoyed certain parts of it or something like that, that makes me feel good. But, but, uh, yeah, that's not something that I, I really go over or anything like that. Well, targeting target is <laughs> one of my all-time favourites. Yeah, well, that was a great. See, just for what it's worth. Yeah. No. Oh, that was a a great performance from Ed Cake. And um, he's a, a musician, Ed Cake, from Breast Creating Cake. And uh, yeah, he's stomping around. And the yeah, bit where the heck I'm a pussy. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> His lines in that, because that was all, he ad lived all of that stuff. Wow. It's just so good. It's an incredible and performance. He bought something completely is, so bizarre. To is that it. the one where he's glad Blade wrapped in himself yeah. and he takes a shit on in, the, in the yeah. pot? In the <laughs> yeah, that was never part hog. of the script. <laughs> Any of that was never part of the original idea. That was just Ed. And a stomping bit. But there's this bit where he's stomping yeah. around. That guy is a genius. He's incredibly clever. I mean, a great musician, mm-hmm. and just so unusual. 